How's everyone doing? Good. For those of you who haven't met, my name is Jerry, and I am so very thankful that you are here. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, you've come to uh, participate in our dedication service. Thanks so much for coming and just celebrating with us. This is a very, very special Sunday for us. If you're maybe here just checking out the well for the very first time, today is our dedication service, so things will be a little bit different, but we hope that you'll get a real sense of the things that we value and how we sort of approach our faith and how we approach being together. Um, my, uh, my mom and dad are here, they're in town, and uh, they were with us in first service, and they're here because my, my second son is graduating, um, and we had the party and all, and all those kinds of things. So I was just kind of reminiscing about my relationship, especially with my dad, and um, my dad loved trains when I was a kid, or at least he loved uh, model trains, and so um, we had this, this screened-in huge porch on our home that we completely converted into our train room. It was, you know, just this massive room of, of magical electronics and modeling and these glistening trains. And I, I absolutely loved it. And I'll never forget, in 1976 was our bicentennial anniversary as a country. And we commissioned a bicentennial train that went around the country with the Liberty Bell in it. And I'll never forget, my dad took me down. We were living in St. Louis at the time. My dad took me down to the arch. Um, to tour the train, to see the Liberty Bell, and that year for my birthday, he bought me a replica of that train for my, for my train set. And, and then when we, when we moved to, um, to Germany, gradually we started switching over to the European types of trains, and eventually uh, we turned one of the rooms down in our basement into a, a big train room. And I just remember for years and years and years as a kid, I couldn't wait until my dad got home because we could go down into our sort of magic place of diesel and engines and, and, and whistles. And, and those, um, those experiences marked me in, in a very profound way. And so I grew up loving trains. In fact, I've got two or three foot lockers full of HO gauge um, model uh, trains. And, and so when Carrie and I started having kids, that was finally my excuse. So I broke out all of my train stuff and got a big piece of, of plywood and, and converted our spare bedroom. And then um, when the boys got their own room for the first time, we did the entire thing in trains. And, and for years and years and years, the um, sort of the piece de resistance of our Christmas celebration was this massive train set that went all the way around our Christmas tree. And it's interesting how certain things stick with you, how, how certain things um, affect you, they, they form you, and, and the things that you don't. They, they shape our lives, they shape our outlook, our image, if you will, the way that we see life, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see God. And family maybe more than any other area of our life, has sort of this unique power, this unique quality to be able to have this impact in our life. And so that's why we're taking these two months this year to really look to see what was family meant to be? How is it that God intends for us to, to connect to one another? How are we to, um, to, to sort of um, love one another in a way that, that exemplifies God's intention, and is there anything that the Bible tells us specifically that gives us insight into that, and within that insight, within those parameters, is there any wiggle room for our differences of personality and temperament and gender, and is there space for our culture and our society to sort of push in as we continue to grow and change? Today, particularly, we're going to be looking at what is parenting meant to be, what did God design us to be as moms? as dads, as future parents, and even as grandparents. One of the, the very first commands in all of Scripture was to be fruitful and multiply. And if you've ever had kids, at some point you have wondered, why? And maybe if God had had to go through the process of actually raising a teenager all by himself, he may have second-guessed this decision as well. 
But over and over and over, the biblical authors seem to stress and impress on us that being a parent, having children, is a blessing. That it is the very sign and seal of God's favor on our, on our lives. So what's with the disconnect? Why, why is the thing that Scripture says so often not the thing that we experience? And is there a way for us to get a right perspective on what it is we're supposed to do? And more importantly, who it is we're supposed to be so that we can finally find our way to that place of blessing in God. So our job as parents, future parents, grandparents, is to give our children a taste of life that is so tantalizing, so wonderful, that they will choose to seek it for the rest of theirs. In other words, we need to allow sort of the realities of heaven and eternity to saturate our homes, our families, our relationships, until it becomes the expression of our lives and thereby the experiences of our children. Our, our responsibility is to, to raise, to direct our children in the way that they should go towards Christ and in healthy community so that they will find success and health and peace beyond this life. So to help us kind of reflect on that, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. So if you have your devices you can pull those up. If you're using our app or the Version app, you know that all of the notes are in there for you. Now, a couple weeks ago, um, as I was kind of preparing for this message and putting it together, I had the opportunity to take uh, Taylor down to southern uh, Chicago uh, for a college visit. And we drove ro- right by the Museum of Science and Industry. Now, the Museum of Science and Industry is one of my all-time favorite destinations in all of Chicagoland. In fact, we love it so much, every time someone comes up, we just take them there. About a month and a half ago, my cousin was here, and uh, we took his whole family. And one of the reasons I love it so much is there is this massive train room. You go in, and there's a scale model of Chicago and the Rockies and Seattle and all of the Metra and the Amtrak and the L that goes all the way in between along with all of, like, the cargo trains. And I could stand in that room and just walk around that model for hours, just getting lost in the intricacies and the complexities and the artistry. And so that's kind of what happened. Everyone else had kind of wandered off, and I was still there in the train room with Des. And, and eventually, Terry came back and found me. She's like, what are you doing? We've all moved on. And she grabbed me, and we, we left. And we left our daughter because we're bad parents again. So, we sp- so after we figured out we had left her, we spent the next half hour or so trying to, to, to find her. But, but any time you put me sort of in proximity, I'll just sort of get lost. And so these are some of the thoughts that were running around in my mind as I looked at this passage for the very first time. Proverbs 22, verse 6. And it says this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he won't depart from it. Now, granted, that's not the kind of train that we're talking about here. Maybe we could look at it in the New Living Translation to get a better insight. It says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they won't leave it. But even though my my affinity for trains is not specifically what Solomon is talking about in this passage, there are some correlations I think we can make that would give us some insightful, practical application to understanding what Solomon is trying to say to us. Solomon starts by saying simply to us, train. Train up our children in the way that we would have them to go. That word there, train, means literally to dedicate. It's the same word that 2 Chronicles chapter 7 uses when Solomon dedicated the temple. It means to call something by name, to give it its job, to give it its task, to give it its purpose. To set it aside to be used for a certain way. To call it by what it is. In other words, when we train our children, we are speaking over them. We are calling out what we believe they are ultimately destined for. And so that's why the New Living Translation says, direct your children. We could get a picture in our minds of a train track, setting our children on the track that will ultimately lead and direct and guide them to the rest of their life from that very earliest of ages. The New English 
Bible sort of captures the idea that this is something that we start early when it says, um, raise up a boy on the right road. Training, the idea of putting them on a track, of course, also sort of gives us the idea that there are parameters, there are limitations, there is discipline and, and, and order that is going to be brought to bear on them. We could imagine any train track. Once the track is set, the train's course is fixed. Now, I know as soon as I say that, we all have fresh images running around in our head of the Amtrak that derailed recently in Philadelphia. As they've continued to study the crash, one of the things that they discovered is that the train was going more than double the speed that was legal for the turn that it was making. It was literally out of control when it derailed. And what we're talking about is trying to create a system, a process, a community, a direction for our children's lives that will keep them from going out of control and derailing. And it's not that they won't try. I remember when the boys were really little, we went down to Disney World. And one of the rides down there is you can ride, drive these old Model T style cars. And they really drive and you have full control over them. But there's this large wire track that runs down the center of the road. And if you try to get too far to one side or the other, the track sort of engages the car and you kind of get jerked back. Well, Isaiah was driving, and the entire time around the track, we were just going from one side and then being kind of snapped, and then we would cut directly across the road and then kind of be snapped because Isaiah was determined to choose his own course and not let that track determine his outcome. But the inventors of the ride had the forethought to not allow the car to ever build up enough speed that it could jump the track. What we're talking about is creating the kind of processes into our kids' lives that will help them stay where they need to be and the willingness that as long as they're in our home that when accidents happen and they do go astray that we're willing to go get them and bring them back onto the way they should go. Because according to this verse, there is a way that they should go. The verse says, direct your children onto the right path And when they're older, they won't leave it. The right path for when they're older. In other words, while training might begin while they're very young, it extends deep into their life, beyond the teenage years, beyond graduation. In fact, the rabbis and the Talmud taught that the emphasis of this passage was actually those years from 16 to to 24. So as we try to cast a direction and a course for our children's life that would literally span a lifetime for them, we get a sense of the complexity and the difficulties that we're being asked to engage. We have a video of some parents considering what the future of their children might hold. So watch this video with us. They say, you know, if you want to hear God, God laugh, tell them your plans. And I, just, I feel like that's sort of how our life has gone. Every time we think we have it all figured out or we know what we have planned next, God throws a wrench in it. And it's like, ha, that's not what's happening at all. And it always ends up better. And you can see God's plan in things. So the truth is, I don't, have a, I don't know what God has in store for Reese. I hope it's something wonderful and great. And I imagine that it is. But in order, I, I can't predict what God has planned. I think he knows more than I could ever imagine. I hope that he's got big things. Um, you know, he's, like John said, he's a fighter, he's a strong kid, he's a happy kid, and we just hope that that continues throughout his life. <laughs> he's a, Isaiah's a interactive little guy. I think we've already seen in his life. He's very social, he loves people, he loves to, uh, make people smile from across the room. So I have a feeling and, and my hope would be that he would continue to have that love for people and that his um, infectious personality would bring joy to those that are around him. Mm-hmm. She is a unique little girl. I know everyone says that about their child, but I, I've i never met a child like this. And so I, again, I pray that her strength, we can help channel her strength Um, to do mighty things for the Lord. I hope we can channel just that strong spirit that she has to really um, like get to know God in a way um, 
that's special and then that can reach a lot of people. Mm. <laughs> He's gonna be the Hulk. <laughs> He's gonna be the Hulk. Yeah, I think. It, yeah. One of our other kids is a lover. He hugs anybody, everybody. Oh, yeah. The other one, she's gonna make you love Jesus because she's <laughs> brute. And uh, I think he's gonna be the gentle giant yes. for Jesus. <laughs> Andrea found John 15 11 um, for Mac, which really just kind of represents being filled with God's joy and that the joy is full uh, in us. And for him, we feel like that he's got that already. Um, so that his joy is God's joy and God's spirit and that he can bring that to other people. And so that would be something that we're hoping for him is that whatever he does that... Um... So as moms and dads, we, uh, we sort of struggle with the idea of what does the right way mean? What is the right path? Traditionally, the church and different interpreters have taken this in some different ways. For years and years and years, the going wisdom was you raise your kids in church and when they're older, they're going to love church. That, that was not my experience. Others began to reflect more on the child's nature, the child's temperament. It became more about understanding the child's sort of, um, his unique ability and, and thoughts. This isn't something new. The, um, the theologian Sadia suggested that we should train our children according to their abilities and according to their potential, that the wise parent would discern their natural bend, if you will, of the individual child and train and raise them accordingly. The word in the passage does give room and encourage us to acknowledge with respect the individuality of our children, but not necessarily to consider their self-will. In fact, the emphasis on the passage is still for parents to do their duty of training them. Training a child with regard to its natural bend, of course, is practical and insightful. But in terms of the book of Proverbs, there were really only two ways. There was the way of the wise, the way of the diligent, the way of the prudent. And it always led towards light and life. And then there was the way of the fool, the way of the wicked. And it always resulted in loss or harm or darkness or at worst, death. So maybe rather than thinking strictly along lines of vocation or uh, their, their ability, rather than thinking strictly along lines of religious, maybe, maybe we're being invited to get a larger, more holistic picture for the lives of ourselves, our families, and our children. The Old Testament scholar Crawford Toy summarized it this way. He said, according to his way is not exactly in the path of industry or piety. In other words, it's not about their vocation or their religious exercise. It was not according to their, their bodily or their mental development as a child. It was in accordance with the manner of life that they were destined for eternity. In other words, that we could contemplate the character and the nature of God and eternity and heaven itself and seek to make that the experiences of our children that would form them and cause them ultimately to be changed into. So in raising them in the way they should go, the right way, it's about those intangible qualities in God's character and in his nature. The way that we think about people. The, the, the way that we treat people, all people. The way that we think about God. The, the way that we enter into relationship with God. The way that we think about ourselves. The way that we treat and allow others to treat us. And all of these, according to Solomon, have to be rooted in righteousness and wisdom. And that makes it infinitely more difficult, but it makes it so much better, so much more worthwhile. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, and he said, listen, when you pray, pray to your Father. This is a personal thing that you're doing, and I want you to pray like this. Your will be done in earth, in us, in our community, as it is in heaven. 
In other words, the same kind of experience that someone might enjoy in heaven, that's the kind of experiences we want them to have here. The kind of relationship that one might enter into in eternity, those are the kinds of relationships that we want people to enter into here. In the same way that, that every design and will of God is fulfilled in eternity, we want the design and the will of God fulfilled in our lives, in the life of our family, and in the lives of our our children. This is the heart of this way that our children would experience something of, of heaven and eternity and Christ and His Holy Spirit in our homes, in our relationships with them. And that having that forming their life as they grow, having tasted of life, real life, and health, real health, peace, realizing the difference, that they would never choose to walk away, that they would seek to be these same sort of heavenly citizens here, and that they would raise their children in that same spirit, in that same vein. We're saying to them, Discover real life in light of and in respect to who you are. And that means that that maybe our approach to every child isn't going to be unilateral. Because each child is unique and distinct and different. But the world to which we invite them to join. That should be something that we all hold and share together. Because in the end, what we want for our children is is peace, it's joy, it's health, it's life. It really doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum in terms of Jesus this morning. Because we share in common our hope for our children. Then we have this mission together. Because the promise was that if if we could give them a taste of life, if we could give them a taste of the divine, if we could give them a taste of eternity, that it would so saturate and touch and fill their heart, it would mark them in such a way that they would never leave. Psalms 34 verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Peter, when he was writing to the church, In 1 Peter chapter 2 said, Tasting of heaven provokes a desire for spiritual growth and maturity. It's hard to walk away from something that has so significantly impacted you in some way. Hence, my adult affection for model trains. Recently, my son Elijah... um, registered for Moody, he's decided to follow myself and his older brother into a life of vocational ministry and service. And from the time the boys were little, I started praying about what their future might hold. I've always taken this passage very seriously, very literally. And so I began to pray And in my heart, I wanted the boys to both end up in vocational ministry. Maybe it was because that's sort of every parent's impulse to want their kids to follow after them. To sort of validate our own choices, if you will. Maybe it was because having served in that place, I realized the deep need that we have in the church for excellent young men and women to come and share the load. But at the end of the day, if I'm honest, I was never really confident about what it was that they were supposed to do. It wasn't that I didn't trust God, and it wasn't that I didn't believe in them. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I just wasn't sure what part was God's leading and what part was my sort of hoping. So we just waited and we we watched to see what would happen. Even when Elijah finally came to Carrie and I and said, listen, I really think that's the direction 
that God is beginning to call me and direct me. Carrie and I were very slow to sort of affirm and encourage that in him. We were a little worried that maybe he had fallen into a pattern of following after Isaiah and I just because it's what he had always done. Or that maybe he had seen the, the affirmation and the, and the adulation that, that Isaiah had gotten and he was sort of looking for those, those attaboys. Or, or, or even worse, that just from a point of being familiar with ministry and life and knowing that that's where his brother was, that it would just be easy. And Schaefer's don't do what's easy. So even when he came to me telling me the thing I was hoping he was always going to say, I felt like he needed to work for it. For a time, I had actually thought maybe Elijah would make a good litigator, something like that. He's great at forming arguments. He has tremendous presence. And the truth is, he could have done anything he wanted. I am incredibly proud of him. But at the end of the day, I realized that I was less worried about what Elijah was going to do and infinitely more concerned about who Elijah was going to be that that wasn't a function of his working out his faith and it wasn't going to be a function of what he did professionally. And there's no guarantees. We had Elijah's graduation party the other day and I kept having people come up to me and going, hey, two down, two to go. I was just thinking, man, two to go and they're both girls. Which is tough because the older one is exactly like uh, her mother. And the younger one we have left in so many different places, I'm pretty sure she's shopping for a new family even as we speak. But I do think that there's some steps we can take to help position ourselves as families, as the church, To give our children the best possible chance to find that track, that system, that process, that community, that home. To experience eternity here and now. To let it form and mold them in such a significant way that it becomes not only the experiences of their life. But that they would join us and that it would become the expression of their life. The first thing is I think this what we're doing today has meaning. I think dedicating our children to the Lord is important. To stand in front of a community of brothers and sisters, of peers, and say to them, I commit to you that I will do everything I can to draw heaven into my home, to give my children a taste of Jesus and God that will forever mark and seal them. And I invite you to be a part of that process with me, to come into my home and check to make sure that that's actually what's happening. I stand before you and I ask you to stand with me. So we dedicate our children, we dedicate ourselves to one another. And that leads us to the second part. Guys, we shouldn't try to do this alone. Raising kids, having families, it's tough. And I can't imagine ever having to try to go it alone. I know with absolute certainty that a big part of the reason that I've got the amazing family, the amazing children that I do, is because I have 500 sets of eyes and ears and little hands that all along their life have been helping me direct them and keep them on track. And every time they would get off, someone would come let me know, and I could have that conversation with my kids. But also every time Carrie or I got off track, there was someone standing there to say to us, Jerry, I think you're being too hard. Jerry, I think you're letting this thing go too far. And help bring our family back on track. So it has been Carrie and I's experience throughout our, our marriage that we have lived in small groups with close friends. And we've given them permission to speak into our lives We have connected intentionally our children to other adults so when they were struggling with mom or dad, when they weren't sure about what we were saying, they could go to those relationships that we had actively built into their lives and have conversations that would either affirm them or go to work defending them on their behalf to Carrie and I. 
guys, look around. God says that we are a gift to one another. So I want to commit to you that we are here for you. That I am here for you. That this great thing that we have been called to, to bring heaven to earth, that people could experience it in our families, in our homes, and in our coming together, is something we're going to do together. Would you stand with me? To lead us in a song and to give our families a chance to kind of get themselves into position. As they do, I want to just invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to ask you the question, have I fully committed myself to Christ? Am I allowing Him to direct not just my vocation, not just the way I celebrate my hope in Him, but is He really taking shape in me? Is He forming my relationships? Is the experience that other people have when they come in contact with me something of Christ? Are you committed? Are you dedicated to making that true? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence in our lives. We thank you that you haven't left us to figure this out on our own, that you've given us your word, you've given us your spirit so that we could find your will. So God, lead us, direct us. Have your way in us. Speak to our hearts. Draw heaven into our homes, into our lives so that our kids will get a taste of you. And Lord, they'd never leave it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen.
take your place in the center of our lives, in the center of our lives, Jesus, have your way, have your way, Lord, in our hearts and our lives, in our homes and our families, thank you, Jesus. Open up my heart, it's you. Our biggest hope and prayer for Isaiah is just that he would be able to live a life just filled um, with the knowledge of God's incredible grace for him and us, and um, just that he would be able to um, just, of course, know Jesus. Um, as his Lord and Savior, but more than that, even um, just to live in his grace and just to be filled with joy. And um, yeah, I think that would be, that's some rushes sure. as well. Mm -hmm. um, then he's just a healthy young boy. Um, maybe that his club foot gets better, and also that he just has a strong support network and uh, that he uh, develops a good relationship with God. Yeah, I, I just pray that you know he brings as much joy to people even as he gets older as he does to us now. Um, you know, we have people all the time come up and say, "Hey, he's a pretty happy baby," and you know he doesn't really get upset or anything. And as you can see right now, he's very chill. Uh, but we just hope that he's the same way all throughout life. That that he always brings joy and laughter to people when when he's around them. Our hopes and prayers are that she'll do better growing up in life to make better choices than we did when we were younger and that she's always known that she's loved and cared for and will never feel like she's not. You know, I, I feel that in, in my life something that I have maybe taken some time to learn is to how to be still in the silence and really, you know, listen for God's voice speaking to us and I just I would pray that he might find that at a young, at a young age and um, really be able to hear God speaking to him and giving him direction and guiding him in his life. One of the reasons that we're that we're really doing the dedication is because we feel such a church home with the well, and it was really important for us to not just have um, our marriage and our family help raise them, but to be in a church body, a church community that that is helping us. And, and helping our child, our children grow. So that, that's a huge portion of it. And so I think for our prayer is definitely to have them be not just believers um, to know Jesus, but to really serve him and to serve uh, in this church as they grow up and uh, that they just um, become amazing um, leaders. Uh, for Christ and, and to serve Him. I just hope that uh, He finds the same type of happiness that we've been able to find in each other and in our lives. That His uh, mistakes and His troubles be few in His life and that uh, if He runs into any of those that He would uh, let God's grace fall on Him and uh, let Him guide Him out of those troubles or or problems. But he really likes us because <laughs> we think we're pretty cool. In Luke chapter 2, it says, At the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name that was given to him by the angel even before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time for their purification according to the law of Moses they brought Jesus to Jerusalem, and they presented him there to the Lord. They dedicated him. So we follow in the model, the, the example that was set for us by our Lord. And these families have come to dedicate themselves 
and their children in the same way. Can we just honor them? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Parents, do you come professing Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your lives today? Verse 6 goes on. You have to commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. When you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands. Write them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Moms and dads, do you come to dedicate yourselves to the biblical instruction, to the discipline, and to the love of these children? Joshua said, fear the Lord and serve him with all of your heart. So do you come to dedicate these children into the ultimate control and the will of God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Congregation, do you agree to support these by your example in, um, in acts of service, in the way that you live with them and in front of them? Do you agree to reinforce the biblical instruction and discipline that they're going to receive in the home and in their classes to love these children under the supreme rule of the Lord our God, Jesus Christ? If so, would you just signify that by standing with us this morning? Solomon promised, direct your children onto the right path, and when they're old, they won't depart. Paul promised Timothy that our God was more than able to keep the things that we had committed to him. So today, we commit, we dedicate these children to the Lord. Kylie Madison, we bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. We dedicate you to him for his service and for his glory that all the days of your life, you would know him, that he would know you, that having tasted of heaven, you would never choose to walk away, that you would be his and serve him all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Elijah James, we dedicate you to the Lord for his service and for his honor that all the days of your life you would know him and he would know you, that God would give you insight into his kindness and into his love, that you would take and share that with those around you through your way, through your personality, through your gifts, that even as this morning you've got a little broken limb, that as God is healing you, that he would use you to heal the brokenness in others. In Jesus' name we pray. Lincoln Bishop, we dedicate you to the Lord for all the days of your life. That God would be strong in you. That he would take the gifts and the strengths, the talents and the abilities that he's placed in you. And he would mold them into a man of God fit for his use that you would do exploits in his name, that you really would be a giant, not just in your stature, but in your faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Congregation, would you just stretch your hands towards these families? Lord Jesus, we dedicate these families and these babies to you, they are yours. For you to use, to have, to move, to mold, to direct as you see fit. Have your way in them and in us. And as you draw our hearts together, we pray that you'd be glorified in our relationships, in our home, and in our children. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Can we give our families a big round of applause? Yes.
Well, if you are new here at the well, uh, we have an area in the back of our auditorium that is marked guest services. If you'd like to, you can swing back by there, get a little bit of information. If you're visiting for the very first time, we actually have a gift for you just to say thanks for coming. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that and give us permission to put a face to the name. If you want to stay in this atmosphere of worship, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Right to this door to my left is our prayer room. We've got a family in there. They would love to have a little bit of time to pray with you or just give you a little bit of space so you could pray on your own. But before we head in our different directions, would you just raise your hands and give me the permission to say a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may heaven fill your home and your heart. May it become the expression of your life and the experience of your children. May you be the very salt and light and life of Christ right where you are. And everyone said amen. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to invite a friend.